Hola, I'm Herson Borrero for City and State, New York, and we're joined today in this particular edition of our TV uh, by um, a leader in the labor movement, and also we're fellow Puerto Ricans, and I think we're both born in Ponce. Mm -hmm. We're born, so we're Ponceños, so that adds a little factor there. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be easy on him. Hector Figueroa, welcome. And uh, we read a piece mm -hmm. in, over the weekend, uh, week, uh, first read weekend for city and state New York debunking minimum wage myths mm -hmm. let me just put that in the context of that most people don't know that you're an economist mm -hmm. and so it's there you make an argument saying that this $15 minimum wage is not going to create chaos that it's not going to be Armageddon economic Armageddon and all of that so tell me why uh, you feel that way because small businesses and other businesses are saying it's going to kill them. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a number of reasons. You know, first, you have to look at where our economy has been for the last, you know, 25, 30 years. And if you put it in terms of purchasing power, even $15 is actually a move in the right direction, but it's not sufficient for an individual in Long Island, in New York City, to still avoid. Uh, some reliance on public assistance to some degree. Uh, and it doesn't really, um, uh, in real terms, put us even back to where we were in the 1960s. So it is a movement in the right direction. It's going to put real money in people's pockets. Second, the increase is very gradual. It's not that we're going to go to $15 an hour right away, but rather it's going to happen uh, in a way that businesses will be able to adjust. The experience of Seattle, the experience that is beginning now in LA, uh, in Chicago, it went to 13. Massachusetts is having a minimum wage of $12 an hour. In places where wages have been going up, it has also been gradual. Mm -hmm. And there is a strong correlation with cities where wages have been going up and economic growth. It's actually not what most people are implying, that somehow wages go up and there will be less job creation. That is not true. Job creation depends on many, many factors. And then third, putting money in people's pockets. We know that low-wage workers are going to spend that money. They're going to spend it in La Bodega. They're going to spend it for based the on children. Need. Based, based on, on need. They spend almost every penny uh, of the dollar. Very little is being saved. And when they spend that money, that creates more jobs. It's the old concept of a multiplier effect that is still very real inside our communities and in our economy. And then lastly, what it won't take everybody out totally of public assistance is going to reduce significantly the tax dollars that currently are used to essentially subsidize employers because they are paying minimum wages that are not able to afford people to escape poverty. So uh, we're going to save taxpayers' money. We're going to create more consumer demand, effective demand in our communities, and we're going to do it gradually so businesses can plan based on the increases, what is going to come next and not get a sudden hit. The problem with the narrative, both for a politician, in the case of Governor Cuomo, mm -hmm. that we're subsidizing businesses as corporate welfare in a way, because as you suggest, these people have to subsidize whatever they don't make in wages exactly. to be able to have services. Mm -hmm. But when you have a politician, and in the case, nothing personal, a mm -hmm. labor leader, mm -hmm. most people said, you know, my pockets are going to be picked. So there's a skepticism unless you're actually on the bottom of the totem pole and you actually are not making the $15 yeah. per hour. Yeah, but also, Gerson, the skepticism also comes from many years of an economic discourse in this country that goes in the other direction. So well, it's we, capitalism. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, we, we understand that. Uh, I mean, Adam Smith uh, is quoted as saying, uh, you know, the state spends more time fighting workers, getting higher wages, than trying to correct for excessive profits. It's in the wealth of the nations. We can't find you. I can't see you in the page. So there is a history of skepticism, of resisting workers, sure. getting more money of years and years and years. I, I, look, I, 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 I understand in, in my position in terms of analyzing these things, sure. and not analyzing from an economic, but from political maneuvering from mm -hmm. the vantage point of you know, reporting the real deal and then trying to stay above the fray and saying, okay, $15 sounds wonderful, but I do see the argument of some businesses. But, but, but let me give an example. 
you know, Governor Cuomo makes this case. He's put together a commission. He's named it after his father, who is more famous now than in, in death, with all due respect to uh, the Cuomo family. Uh, so Mario, he names his commission. He names all kinds of people. He's, you know, this panel, and it's gonna, it's gonna go. He even said he's gonna send uh, Carl Hasty, the speaker, uh, on a mission. Like he worked for him. I thought he was an independent <laughs> elector. But having said that, I understand the enthusiasm, and it's all guns. New York State has workers in New York City that don't make fifteen dollars an hour. Exactly. To me, that's hypocrisy. Yeah. My whole thing is, why don't you guys start with the governor and the mayor? that can actually increase the wages, for example, school crossing guards. There are employees in the state. I mean, before you start taking or demanding from small businesses, which are part of this, why hasn't that happened? Because wouldn't that be a, very, a, a more compelling argument? I think that we need it for all of them. Now, here we may depart, perhaps, I haven't heard the arguments from the governor or the mayor on this regard, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear them. But our union is very clear. We need to raise the wage for 15, not just for private sector workers, but also for public sector workers. Okay. Because the savings that we're going to have, let me give you an example of McDonald's. When McDonald's workers, well, those 182,000 workers that are going to benefit from raising the wages to 15, the state is going to save over $700 million in public assistance that okay. is going to those workers. That money can help finance that school cross guards that uh, public service worker who is at you know, 11 $12 an hour. I agree with you that the government needs to set an example where I uh, you know, may have a different view is that I think everybody needs to come up at the same time. And that is one, I like that. That's one of the issues that we have to resolve through our campaign. Um, you know, we have to convince the public that raising the minimum wage to 15, including public service workers that are uh, below 15, is in the benefit of everyone. But to challenge the government to do it first without the tax revenue and still subsidizing the people who are earning less will be harder on the, on the public treasury. Well, you know, by the way, if, if I had my way, I would, per, you know, socialize everything. But then you're a socialist, <laughs> a communist, and everything else. But if you're going to talk the talk, then you got to walk the walk. And I'm saying simple. The governor has spent all this time, probably millions of dollars are going to be spent to try to make that $15 minimum wage. It's very simple. You raise the minimum to every New York State worker, and that would be the less, I mean, that would be an international example of what could be done by government to lead in the way. And I know it's not on you, I'm not putting it on you, but you're a labor leader, you get to talk to these guys, you see the commission he's put together, and everybody's put, by the way, mm -hmm. funny thing is that it's gonna cost everybody money because everybody has, yeah. but it, you know, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, in it, our it, union, we raise uh, to 15, we have interns who come to our union to do work. That's what I ask you, all your and, workers... And we, we are paying more than 15. We're paying 15 or more, because even the students that come to work for us, we're trying yeah, to have 15. Was, I thought I was Porque tenemos you on que hacer eso. Oh, no, no. So, we, so all your we workers... We came early on that discussion. Okay. Yeah, we came so, early so on that discussion. So you did it discussion. as... In other words, mm -hmm. you have... I'm sorry, so that, sure. you know, this is like yeah. bruto proof for me, you know. Bruto means stupid, you know, so I don't have all the facts. So you have your union members who are actual rank and file who pay dues, but then you have workers that work for yeah, those. For the union. Union. Yeah. So you're telling me that you're above the 15 already. For the people who work for the union. For the people who are on the union contracts, we have workers that earn less than 15 because they are in markets like Philadelphia. The, uh, the workers you represent. Yeah, some of them earn less than 15. They have been on the path for many years from minimum wage to higher wages. So for us, raising the minimum wage to 15 is also helping those members of our union that are in the markets that are uh, you know, less capable through collective bargaining to go to $15 an hour. We see this is in our interest too that this helps our low wage members and that this also creates more money in our community. So, so it's very challenging uh, in this current environment for an individual worker or even a small group of workers to make demands of their employer to earn more when everybody else is competing for the same jobs willing to work for less. And so I don't see, I'm trying to get a, a sense. I follow you and I understand that I'm not processing it correctly. So. Mm -hmm. Is this really a losing cause, a losing proposition? Because you will have people, if you pressure or if you bring in the $15, there's nothing that a Mickey D's can just, or I don't want to pick on McDonald's, everywhere. I don't eat the stuff. I think it's garbage anyway, so I wouldn't eat it for free. But having said that, it's, you know, and then we wind up in health insurance. That's why I'm a, you know, I, I support the, Miguelito did a lot of wrong things, but Miguelito was really good in the smoking ban. That's, you know, my opinion. 
It's a conversation, so I'm, you know, we're, but, but having said that, how do you turn around and expect any of these small, they're not small, but they're franchises mm -hmm. and they're owned by people, to be able to absorb, it's going to get passed on to the consumer, which is the argument they're making. So I'm playing devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. Um, how does this turn out? How does it make sense? Yeah. So this is how... Well, they can hire somebody. See, no, no, I, I see you come up. They, they're not unionized, by the way, right? No, no, they're not unionized. And we're still fighting for the union. The campaign right. is 15 and a union. So we know right. that the union fight is going to take longer right. because of the state of labor law in this country and employee resistance to workers having a voice on day-to-day -day issues. But that aside, the franchises uh, work in a system with McDonald's that McDonald's ultimately calls the shot. Even the Happy Meal, you know, Kelonene Compra, the Happy Meal, that is determined by McDonald's. What prices you charge are determined by McDonald's, not by the fresh and see. So from Buffalo to Rochester to New York, the prices for those burgers are set up essentially centrally. And even the real estate very often is real estate that is not owned by the people who are running the franchise, but by McDonald's themselves. They're a great landlord. A lot of the revenue comes from being a landlord. Well, that's how Ray Kroc, the founder of yeah. McDonald's, made the money. It was exactly. real estate and people think it's the cheap burgers they sell. Exactly. The bad so, crap. Yeah, so our theory is that we have a common interest, believe it or not, with many of the franchisees who are, a lot of them are minorities, surviving on a small margin of profit uh, in their relationship to McDonald's. The theory that we have is McDonald's is ultimately the employer here, or Wendy's, or you know, Domino Pizza. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who need to absorb much of the increase. And in addition to that, if you reduce turnover, if you increase productivity and motivation uh, in many of these stores, you know, workers sometimes don't show up to work. Sometimes a franchise owner is calling you know, a Pedro, a Juan, you know, John to come up and show up because somebody didn't show up because he didn't come to work because they pay so little. So they're going to be savings on turnover. Our estimate is that when you look at the totality of the implications of this, it's going to be small cents on the price of a burger if you want to pass it to consumers and you still have the option to renegotiate that contract between McDonald's and the franchisee and put pressure there so the franchisee doesn't have to carry even those few cents. Second, you know, so that's on the dynamic between franchisee and franchisor, McDonald's and the people who are running the restaurants. The second part of this is that you are going to create a situation that, uh, you know, McDonald's is not going to stay the same way that they are. They're introducing breakfast. They're going to introduce new products. They're going to try to create an environment that will incentivize them to increase their revenue even as the wages of the workers go up. We see that in every industry. Industries where wages go up, modernize, improve on the product, improve on the service because they have an additional Give me one pressure. Industry that happens. A very good example. When you look at the races in New York among healthcare workers that 1199 have done so successfully over the years, the practices of nurses staffing, the way that nurses are trained, the way that hospitals are run, have been better than when the workers were decades ago without unions. Another example, the historic example of the auto industry. When Ford decided with the pressure of the unions and many strikes and even bloodshed, that the workers needed to have the union, that at the time created a whole new orientation of uh, introducing new technology and new methods you know, in the auto industry at the time. So it's going to have ramifications in the way that McDonald's does its business that will lead to more worker retention, more investment on the workers because they now stay on the job, and a more diversification of the product mix that McDonald's has in order to you know, compensate for the increase. But let's make no mistake, the increase is very, very, very modest. It's modest? It's modest as if I'm, if I'm, per price of burger. If, if I'm a small store, never mind sure. McDonald's or franchise, I'm independent, I have a business, I have 25 employees, and already I've been hit. I'm in New York City. I've been hit already with sick paydays, which you got to remember. This is, yeah. quite, you know, and you have some really responsible employees, but there are those that are abusadores, you know, okay. that, you know, that take the exit. They, you know, they, they just are going to abusers. They're, they're takers. Mm -hmm. And so how do I deal with my 25 employees? And you're telling me, look, my average wage is nine bucks. Even if it goes up gradually, you know, you can say it goes up gradually, but it's still going to be coming out of the pocket mm -hmm. of the store owner. Um, so how do you, and, and I know the explanation, I understood sure. it, I process it. You know, for a minute there, I thought it was back in school in a, you know, in a, but that's your, you know, uh, you're an economist. But, but in simple terms, and I know you've already explained it, 
Sure. Why should I, if I have 20 employees, I'm on a daily, weekly basis, monthly basis, I'm checking my profit margin, what it is. I was just talking to the guy from La Taza de Oro mm -hmm. on 14th and 15th Street, yeah. and it wound up that he's almost losing, he's, he's already spent like 150000 Just to give you a clear example, he mm -hmm. had employees, I think it was a total of 12, 15 employees. You eat at La Taza de Oro, which is a small, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's one yeah. of the few Puerto Rican restaurants, cheap restaurants, the whole neighborhood comes mm -hmm. by. And He's trying to survive. He owns the buildings, fortunately, and all that. But this guy is already looking at this. I mean, I haven't talked to him about this, but why should I give a damn if, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like people who are already getting their part. You know, some people look at unions and say, oh, these guys are ruining the economy. These guys should be bombed. But then, on the other hand, there's also the government who's also trying to hey, go back to the original mm -hmm. point, picking our pockets, and we get our pockets picked anyway. So as a consumer, really, I know you explained it. Sure. In simple terms, if it goes up, if you're at nine bucks and I got 25 employees, how long does this take? The way you guys have laid it out, labor and the, how long before it hits me at a full 15? So, if I'm at nine. So it's, it's, every business will have its own dynamic based no, on their own okay. success, right? So you can pass part of the increase to consumers, okay. especially if we raise the minimum wage. Those people who go to the Taza de Oro are the people who are going there because, you know, it's more affordable or for reasons that they like, you know, to be connected to it, uh, you know, instead of going to any of the other restaurants in Chelsea. You yeah, raise the minimum exactly. wage, they can have more money to spend. They will be able to afford that coffee uh, cup for a few cents more or that uh, ensalada de bacalao, you know, for a few cents more. Uh, so. The two pieces go in tandem. You know, raising the minimum wage for fast food workers creates a door that we need to fight in Albany to raise the minimum wage for everybody. Second, there will be less turnover of workers. You know, La Taza de Oro is paying minimum wage. It's competing with a lot of other places that that restaurant worker could go somewhere else if they are paying less than the minimum wage. Or paying, you know, at the minimum wage. Sometimes less because it may include tips. So, I don't know if they're considered tip workers yeah. in that particular no, they example. Are, they are, they are. So, so what I would say is, you know, small businesses will have to go back to their, to their business model and adapt and adjust, evaluate how much turnover they have, how much are they losing because they're changing people all the time, pass some of the cost to the consumer, and if we succeed, and I think we will, because I think it's inevitable that the minimum wage will go up, and I think we can bring it up to 15, then they're going to have a new base of consumers with new found money in their pockets to be able to invest in those businesses. The best example is Seattle. I know, but, but wait, wait, Besides wait. Besides theory. I'm, I'm, wait, I don't care yeah. about Seattle. The hell but with Seattle. Important. No, it isn't. Seattle, Not for me. I'm in Queens. No, wait a minute. If, are, if I'm know. in Queens and I have a store and I got 25 yeah. employees and it's a hardware store and damn it, I'm paying my, you know, the lowest guy is making nine and, the, and there's a, 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 a person in accounting that I have and she's making 12 and you guys are telling me it's going to have to come to 15, but I have more use for the accountant and she's worth more than the worker who's just handling the, mm -hmm. I, what I'm saying is how do you make sense of this? I don't care about the, Seattle. The, the, well, but I'm talking about the business owner. Yeah, and, and the I reason, but well, the reason why I bring an example of another city is that we could talk about what may or may not happen. But in theory. Seattle is different. When you use these hectares, you're smart, mm -hmm. man. You use this. Who cares? The, the cost of living here is unequal to any place else, especially after the 12 years of Miguelito. Okay, but if we're talking about New York, and what we're saying is that this business can only survive in New York by paying poverty wages. And essentially, that's the only way that they can make it and manage it in this economy. Then we're saying something that is profoundly disturbing. Because what we're saying is that our business sector can only survive by keeping people in poverty and essentially being indirectly subsidized when these people go to get food stamps, to get all sort of other benefits from the state, and then the consumer, as taxpayers, but that's have to foot the bill. But that, that's that is low road capitalism. Okay. There are many but, versions of capitalism. In Sweden, McDonald's pays okay. $22 an hour. I prefer that version of capitalism oh, so than, the one that, than the one that we have. No, so do I. I'm just so, arguing what facts are. No, no, I know. And I, and I think these are good facts. But what we need to do is we need to advocate for policies that alleviate the burden of operating business in other areas, but not at the expense of workers. Is this the right way to go? I know the efforts put in by Governor Cuomo, mm -hmm. partially because he wants to make the Blasio look like crap. But aside from that, the political motivations, 
Is this the right way to go? This is totally the right way to go. And it's going to help our state and our city. And it's going to provoke a conversation about how our economy can adjust to be on a high road of a high impact economy where workers are earning more and putting that money back in the economy, as opposed to a low impact economy where the contribution of workers is essentially low, cheap We're, labor. Uh, I'm going to really get you in trouble in the exit question. Sure. So the exit question is, considering what you're saying right now, what you're arguing, would Bernie Sanders be a better president than anybody else? I think Bernie Sanders would be a wonderful president. If he was a lot younger, he would probably have a better chance. Uh, we think that he has made an incredible contribution to the campaign. Hillary is, is an incredible you know, leader in the Democratic Party. By the way, Governor O'Malley, which very few people know as much, not a great speaker, but he was a good governor in many ways in Maryland. You look at the Republican field, God save us, because it's incredibly challenging. And I'd rather what see What are you them. talking about? That, that Donald Trump has got a great, great, great there plan. What are you talking about? Come on, man. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hector Thank Figueroa. You. Good luck on Thank your you. efforts and $15 para todo el mundo. Para todo el mundo. Herson Borrero for City and State. We'll see you in the next show.